Hey everyone, I'm Jerry Weinstein and the name of my talk is Making the Metaverse Civic. I want to first thank the Gatherverse team for inviting me to share my thoughts. I had the pleasure of getting to know Christopher Lafayette last month as part of a discussion for the Reyes Conference, and I quickly thought that I had found a new member of my tribe. The principles he espoused that would anchor the summit resonated deeply. I'd also like to thank his colleagues, Joanne, Rose, and Donaldi for their help. So even though I come from the world of civic tech, which I'll define in a second, I am no slouch when it comes to virtual worlds. I even co-wrote a book with the subtitle Rewiring Your Emotional Future about 13 years ago. In fact, I've been thinking about online identity, this is gonna date me, for at least 25 years. When I was an editor at the MIT Press, I helped launch Cognet, a global digital community for cognitive scientists. And 20 years ago, I worked at WebLab, which created some of the first online discussions for documentaries for public TV, including American Love Stories, which focused on interracial marriage. I myself have moved back and forth between social justice organizations, such as GLAAD, the NAACP, to making documentary films, and working as a speech writer and strategist in media, including the New York Times and The Guardian. But I am especially proud of my work in the civic tech space. We think of civic tech as using technology as little or as much as is needed to increase civic engagement and inclusion. At Civic Hall, which is a national hub for civic tech that's been around now for seven years, I mentored several hundred startups and their founders. In many cases, their existence was prompted by the experiences of their founders. Exceptional people who were frustrated that the obstacles to their success weren't personal, but systemic. And they set out to solve these problems. Today, I wanted to share a few stories and ultimately shine a light on how important it is to intentionally build an inclusive infrastructure and to take the lessons of IRL as opposed to learning from the World Wide Web. The most striking thing I learned again and again and again is how stack, stack the deck is for folks who aren't straight, white, Christian males. Sorry, my dudes, y'all are born in third base with a sympathetic empire ready to wave you home. A core principle of civic tech is build with. Don't build on behalf of, you'll get it wrong. I might care deeply about the disability community, my sister had cognitive delays, but I don't know firsthand their challenges. I haven't moved through their day. And in fact, solutions that they have been pushing for, in some cases for decades, I may be unaware of. COVID exposed the issues that the most vulnerable were experiencing before the pandemic. It both worsened the situation for these at-risk populations and bled into the broader population. What's so interesting about how COVID affected the disability population is that it revealed an enormous lie. They were told always, remote work, that's not feasible. And as we imagine the future of work, how can we commit and demand all workplaces be accessible for disabled folks to work wherever they want. I had the honor to get to know the founders of WearWorks about five years ago. Keith Kirkland and his co-founders were focused on navigation. They developed the Wayband by interviewing hundreds of low sight individuals and ultimately creating a prototype, a haptic device for blind, marathon runners, understanding that if it were successful, it could help millions of low sighted individuals and give them the ability to get around on their own, to leave their homes, to work, to live life. And actually it's not a moment too soon. We have predictive data that as our population is aging, macular degeneration will double over the next 20 years. You might think that folks who are defending their country, any country, are welcomed with open arms after they are discharged or retired. At least in the States, you'd be wrong. 
After Alana was medically retired from a traumatic brain injury and exploding IUD in Afghanistan, despite her graduate degree in engineering from Cornell, she couldn't find work. And her benefits, like most vets, vets were exhausted after seven months. Lana launched Pathfinder, which uses natural language processing and AI to assess both wellness and skill preparedness among veterans and then to train them up. As one of the few dozen lady vets, that's what she call herself, with a purple heart, Lana struggled to secure contracts, but persevered. This is that message that I hear over and over, how few women, white women even, were staked by VCs. And it was far worse for women of color. The stat is less than 1% get funded. Take my friend Ivelisse, the founder of Radical Health. She is the first Latina to launch a B Corps in the borough of the Bronx, where I was born. Radical looks at the systemic drivers of health inequality and creates low-tech and high-tech solutions from restorative health circles to chatbots that are companions to expectant mothers of color and also help them in their first year after giving birth. To me, it is the essence of civic tech and an object lesson for the infrastructure that needs to be built inside the metaverse. Ivelisse was able to create her radical relay app because Jason, the founder of Quadrant 2, which I consulted for a few years ago, um, had been in the space. Jason developed the first bystander app for the public. He was at Occupy Wall Street protesting and didn't mind getting arrested for good trouble, but he wanted his loved ones, especially his 10 month year old, to know that daddy was safe. So he created an app called I'm Getting Arrested with, with a few modifications was later used by New York Civil Liberties Union for bystanders to record and save illegal police stops of young black men immediately to the cloud and was used as part of the data argument to end stop and frisk. Some startups aren't shiny and innovative, but the impact they make is profound. Take Benefit Kitchen, started by Mel and Dan, who met 25 years ago while they were at the Peace Corps. They learned that $80 billion, that's a B, is left on the table by folks who are actually able, eligible for food stamps, now called SNAP, and many folks who qualify for Obamacare, but are intimidated by the application process. Their startup makes forms easy, whether it's Google Forms or chatbots that qualify you for benefits. And if you're worried that your immigration status might be used against you, they thought about that. You can complete the forms without registering print and take the form to the government office for approval. On average, their users get about $8,000 annually in benefits. That is life-changing. And it always makes me think about forms I've prepared. Am I making the experience hard for people or seamless? One of the populations most affected by COVID has been the houseless. While some cities opened up their hotels, New York City wasn't as charitable. And when it closed our 24 seven subways for a few hours a night, this tossed people out into the cold. Shelters are congregant housing. So the likelihood of getting COVID was actually higher than living on the street. I've worked with two organizations that center lived experience and have folks who have experienced homelessness as part of their board and their core organization. Human.nyc, which was started by my friend Josh when he was a sophomore at NYU, has shared that the journey to permanent housing is fraught. It can take two years. While the goal is to change that process, Josh believed that the best way to do that was to demystify the infuriating steps that were required, each by a different member of the community telling their story. For example, in New York City, if you sleep on the street, 
you have to be in the same general location for spot checks over a period of six months. Otherwise, you start the process again of being considered for permanent housing. Before Civic Hall, as a lifelong New Yorker, I actually knew few veterans apart from my dad. I also knew no refugees. One of my mentors is the great Barbara Smith, a queer African-American woman whose activism and publications have inspired me. She told me early on in getting to know her that coalition is discomfort. So don't get comfortable, get engaged. This being Black History Month, I also wanted to shine a light on a no-tech project, which means a great deal to me. Racial Justice BK, as in Brooklyn, is both a living room discussion group, which meets monthly, and a partner to activist groups working on criminal justice reform and equality. We include folks of every background, race, sexuality, ability, age, class, gender, and the discussions can get awkward, even heated. But over a four-year period, I see change where we have created trust and the possibility of transformation. Many of us, including me, have recognized where we benefited from privilege and considered how to be better allies and stand up for others. One of the startups that incubated out of Civic Hall that I was an advisor to is a diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI for short, dashboard called Pluto. Over the years, we've learned just how implicit bias can operate. I've created ways to describe an organization's state of play by having employees talk about their experiences and then turning that into data. And we've then created programs nudging employee, employers rather to do better. It can be sobering just to learn how ubiquitous bias and bigotry can be and how it holds a company back from succeeding. But I have seen folks learn from findings and slowly move forward. What I want the gather Uverse community to consider is that we must be in solidarity, recognizing that the health and safety of the least of these, a uh, term from the Bible, recognizing the most vulnerable, and I'm an atheist, but I use it, that solving for the least of these determines the strength of the community. Thank you for checking out my talk. I will be sharing links and I look forward to engaging you all in discussion. Thank you again, Gatherverse.